So let's get back to the book of Daniel, and we're going to ask him the question, are we the real deal? We certainly find out from Scripture that Daniel was. Amen? Uh, we left off on last week uh, talking about Daniel and, and, and uh, his comrades who were taken into Babylonian captivity. Now, we know as we study this Scripture text that, that this process that they were going through, Judah being taken captive by uh, the Babylonians, was part of God's disciplinary measure for them. Because uh, oftentimes when you study the history of God's people, like us today, many times we will pursue God and God blesses us and then all of a sudden we'll turn away from him and start doing life on our own. We turn away from him and start doing life the way we think it ought to be done and, and turn our backs on him. But God loves each one of us enough that he will use whatever measures necessary to bring us back into his presence. And guys, let's, let, let's be honest about it. So many of us are so hard-headed. Let me say it again. So many of us are so hard-headed that we won't listen to the pastor who tells us what God's word says. We won't listen to our mom and our dad. We won't listen to our uncle. We won't, we won't listen to our coworker, whoever, or church member. We, we sit up and we want to do life our own way and many times the only way God gets us to turn our backs, turn our hearts back toward him is he has to take us through a process, to take us through a valley experience, to take us through some turmoil. And that's what we see happening here in the book of Daniel. We know that they were taken into captivity and part of that, uh, that, that deal was that they would be indoctrinated into Babylonian culture. So let's pick back up, if you will, uh, at verse number uh, of this of this first chapter, let's pick back up at verse number, uh, verse number four. Let's go to verse number four. Glory to God. Verse four of this uh, first chapter. The text says, uh, select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men, he said. This is the king talking. Make sure they're well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and the literature of Babylon. What they are seeking to do, the Babylonians, whoever they bring into captivity, they want to indoctrinate them into Babylonian culture. Well, part of that was is certain things in, uh, that they were requiring for them to eat, right? And we knew that those certain things that they were requiring for these young men to eat was against their dietary restrictions as at, that, at that time. Remember I told you on last week, you got to understand dis dispensation, during Old Covenant dispensation, there were certain things that God forbade his people to, to partake of. But we find out in the New Covenant dispensation that whatever we can eat, uh, whatever we desire to eat, we can eat as long as we bless it before we eat it. Now, again, I say that with this in mind, that, that if your doctor has told you that certain, eating certain thing is killing you, then you'll be wise not to eat it. and go, Don't go tell your doctor, Pastor Adam said, I can eat whatever I want to eat. <laughs> Come on now. If you know you have, got high blood pressure, come on, there are certain things that you ought to, you ought to stop cooking with. But as a general rule, there, your righteousness is not garnered by what you eat and how you dress. We ought to dress in moderation, but you can wear a dress as long as this floor is, but that don't make you righteous. Under New Covenant dispensation, we are made righteous by the saving sacrificial death of Jesus Christ out on Calvary's hill, amen? And that's the only way we get in right standing with God. So we keep on reading. He says in verse 5, the king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchen. They were to be trained for three years and then they would enter the royal service. So we got to keep moving. So let's, we, we, we said we're going to pull out some key application concepts from the book of Daniel. You see, because if Daniel was the real deal, there are some things about his life that I think all of us can learn. Right? When we come into the body of Christ, then once we make a personal decision to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, then now it is incumbent upon each one of us to grow in our faith. As newborn babes, the Bible says, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. It is word taken in our head and placed down in our heart that produces spiritual growth and nourishment in our lives. So we are, we, are, we are called to grow in our faith. Everybody say, I got to grow. Now, growing makes us become 
like the real deal. In other words, when we grow in our faith, when we allow the Word of God to, to be the preeminent source for guidance in our life, it puts us in a position where we can grow and be a quality representative of Jesus Christ here on earth. Because every last one of us in here have been called to be ambassadors for Christ. Each one of you here, each one of you here, each one of you over here, each one of you over here, you're in the balcony. All of us have been called to be ambassadors for Christ. So Daniel here is our model that we're looking at right now because not Daniel was not perfect, but we see that his lifestyle was indicative of somebody who was really real. Now, again, they, they had these dietary restrictions that they were not uh, uh, supposed to partake in, and so they, they, they talked to the guy who was over them and said, hey, listen, just test us out. Let's, we're going to eat vegetables and, and just drink water for the number of days that the king is assigned for, assigned for us to eat these things. And let's, let's measure it after that period of time. And you all know the story, how it was that they looked better than the ones who had ate the king's food, right? So let's skip down, and we're going to go to verse number 19. Go to verse number 19. Uh, and so uh, the key application concept, we're, we're going to jump into that real quick. It says, the king talked with him, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. The text says here in verse number 20, whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them 10 times more capable than any of the magicians and the enchanters in his entire kingdom. So last week we told you, we said, uh, number one, recognize and respond affirmatively to God's work of discipline in your life. Recognize and respond in the affirmative to God's discipline in your life. Whom the Lord loveth, he does what? He chastens, the Bible says. If you belong to God and you get outside of the will of God, then God, in his effort to keep you close to him, will sometimes, not sometimes, he will always bring disciplinary measures into your life to get you back on track. That could be any number of things. All right? So how do you know if you're off track or not? Somebody give me, how, how do you know if you're off track or not? Somebody help me. How do you know if you're off track or not? You get checked? Okay, no prayer line. Right. You know if you're off track or not if what you're doing doesn't line up with his will. What is his will? His word. That's why we study the Bible. Study to show thyself a proven to God, a workman who needed not be ashamed, but does what? Rightly devise the word of truth. So it's critically important about, of, of us as believers to spend time in God's word. Now, listen to me carefully. As your pastor, I love every last one of you guys. And I'm, I'm going to say something to you. It's going to sound a little harsh, but I don't mean to be harsh. I'm just going to be blunt. It's okay to be blunt. I'm going to be like the Pastor Paul. Pastor Paul. I'm going to speak the truth in love. Can I do that for you? We all let your pastor speak the truth in love to you. Will you not be mad at me? It's okay if you're mad at me, okay, for a little while. But just, just kind of say, oh, that's my pastor again. <laughs> Hear me carefully. If you are a member of this church, whether you live stream it or here in person, if you are a member of this church, but you won't participate in discipleship training, you're not on your way to being the real deal. Can I say it again? If you are a member of this church, or any church for that matter, but you, can't, you can find time to go to every event under the sun, from every festival to every ball tournament that's known to mankind, you travel all over the world with your children, and nothing wrong with a man supporting your children, but, but I think God has a problem with all of us when we can find time to do everything except Spend time with him. And then we think we're okay. Can I wipe my forehead right quick? I have, to, I have to put it to you that way because there are many people who are part of the body of Christ, but yet and still we say we love Jesus, but yet we spend no time with Jesus. Now I'm going to tell you all something. If I told my wife I loved her but never did anything for her, never spent any time with her, then my confession is off base. Go to John 1 and 1 right quick. John, the first chapter, verse number 1. The gospel according to St. John, John 1 and 1. 
And we're going to look at it from the KJV. John 1 and 1. All right, you say you love Jesus. Love is an action word. We got to show that we love, right? So the text says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Can we read the next verse? It says, the same was in the beginning with God. What is the same? The word was in the beginning with God. Keep reading. Let's go. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was what? That was made. Keep reading. Let's go, guys. In him was life, and the life was the what? Was the light of men. Uh, let's, keep, let's keep reading. Next verse is what? And the light shineth in darkness, and the dark, darkness comprehended it not. Let's go down, if you will, to verse number 14. It's still talking about the Word, okay? The Word was in the beginning. The Word was with God. The Word was God, all right? So we talk about the Word. We're talking about God's revealed will through his holy scripture. What I'm getting at is, guys, if I say that I love God, but I never spend any time with God, there is something wrong with that confession of faith. Just like if I say I love my wife and never spend any time with my wife, then, then uh, something is wrong with my profession of faith. Or if I say I love my husband, but don't want to spend any time with my husband, not, not me. <laughs> if, my, can I, can I, I have to, nowadays I got to explain that. 40 years ago, I wouldn't have to explain that, but let me explain what I'm saying now. I'm saying my wife, if she doesn't spend any time with me, then something is wrong with that, that, that confession of love. Right? So in the beginning was the word with God, the word was God. But you say you love God, but don't spend any time with God's word. As a matter of fact, as a member of this church, if you don't, if you don't participate in the discipleship training process, you actually negate your ability to grow as a Christian because that's our, that's our mantra. It should be any church's mantra is to disciple the people who are part of the church. You can't lead if you're not, if you're not willing to be a disciple. And God watches us. He knows us. He sees us when we go and do everything else except what he requires for us to do in his word. And the word was what? It was what? What is this talking about right here? This is talking about Jesus Christ being born. The word was in the beginning. Jesus was always in the beginning. Jesus, Jesus did, just didn't come into existence in the manger in Bethlehem. He, was, he always was. Because it's God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. When the Bible says in Genesis that God said, let us make. Who is the us? It's the triune God here. God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Son was always there because in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word was made flesh. God was made flesh. God was manifest in human flesh. God interjected himself into, into humanity in order to deliver humanity. Amen. Bless God Almighty. Thank God that he loved us enough to say, I'm going to come down and I'm going to pour out of myself. I'm going to be born into human flesh and I'm going to offer the ultimate sacrifice so that man can have relationship with me. Bless be to God. I thank God for that. But if I say I love him, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So I, I don't know about anybody else, any other husbands, but my wife, if, if I get to where I don't spend time with her, she gets, a, she gets a little attitude with me. Can I get a witness up here? Laura Jones, I know you probably get a little attitude with Carl if he spent all this time riding horses and don't spend any time with you. You can say, wait a minute now. <laughs> Love ex exudes itself through time. How, pray tell me, can you say you love God, but you don't spend any time with him? We fool ourselves. Every man proclaimed his own goodness, but a faithful man, the Bible says, who can find? A man who's pursuing after God. So, guys, I want to encourage you. Uh, this is, I'm not fussy. I'm just telling you that if you, if you are a member of this church, but you refuse to connect to discipleship training, your growth is going to be stunted. Because I know, here's what I know. Don't tell me you're studying on your own. 
And even if you were, then now you are outside of God's will because the Bible says, obey those who have the ruling authority over you. As your pastor or leader, I'm saying this, this is part of the discipleship training process. I want you to grow and I want you to be developed. And so part of our discipleship training process is such that we spend time in the Word. This is not a church where you can come and shout the benches over, <laughs> tear up everything, and go out and live like you want to live without being challenged to do it differently. So as your pastor, I love you enough to challenge you to do it differently. So, so we got to spend time in the Word. So recognize and respond affirmatively to God's work of discipline in your life. When we get away from that, God calls. That's why Judah was in captivity here. God used a heathen nation. He used a heathen nation to discipline his children. And I'm going to tell you something. God will use whatever he wants to use to get us back in, in right fellowship with him. All right, so the second thing we told you was is we got the resolve to always be a person of integrity. Always. Everybody say always. always. Always be a person of integrity. Daniel was consistently a man of integrity, and this integrity was evident to all who came in contact with him. We saw that in some scripture readings we gave you on last week. The Bible speaks a lot about what it means to be a person of integrity. So get to the third point. Third point we, we want to share with you is, is that we, you know, if the concept we learn is that we got to make every effort to maintain a good reputation throughout our life. A good reputation throughout our life. Look, go back to Daniel chapter number one, and let's look at verse number 19 and 20, and we're going to go to verse, the second chapter. Are you still with me today? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I want to know, are you the real deal? Because guys, how many of y'all know that, 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 that the church has an image problem? It shouldn't, because we got the greatest story, the greatest love story that's ever been manifested in the earth. The Lord God loved us so much, Sherry, that he gave his only begotten son that whoever decides they want to believe in him, and they, they won't perish, but they'll have everlasting life. What, what a beautiful testimony. And our story should be told to a hurting world. But instead they see dysfunctionality in the church. They see bickery. They see lack of unity in the church and it's causing many to say, I don't want any part of that. Now guess, guess what, guys? The church ain't this building. The church is you. How do you act when you're at work, when you're at home, when you're in the grocery store? How do you act? How do you behave when you're in a restaurant eating? Are you mean? To the waitress, I was, I, was, I was reading something the other day about this, this group that uh, and it really blessed me, and I think I'm, I'm going to do that. Well, I told you about Maria and I. What we'll do, we'll go and, and um, we'll go to a restaurant. Or we, we'll even go to a, a, a drive through fast food place sometimes. And just, just to be a blessing to somebody, we'll, we'll tip them. At, we've tipped before when we got good service at a Popeye's, <laughs> which has been rare if you know what I'm talking about. Come on. Can't <laughs> you say, leave him alone, leave him alone. Somebody just needs to have some, some customer service training. I love, you know, one of the reasons why I go to Chick-fil-A, because when I go there, how may I help you, sir? Get my order. I said, thank you. My pleasure, sir. Man, that makes me feel good. It, it seems like they wanted me to come and spend my money there. Rather than some place you're going to be like, why are you bothering me? Why are you driving up in here? I don't want you to be here. All right? Okay, all right. So y'all made me forget what I was getting ready to say. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody's paying attention, right? Even if I'm not. But what we would do is uh, this, 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 this particular group, they'd meet for lunch. And uh, once, once a year around Christmas time, and they'll ask everybody to bring $100 with them. And then uh, after eating, they, bl they blessed the waitress who served them with that $100. Each one of them is about $1,400, $1,500. So they collected about $1,500 and blessed that waitress with $1,500. Wow. <laughs> now, now, what Marrera and I will do is we'll go and, uh, like I said, we'll even tip sometimes to the fast food place when we get good service. And when we get good service at a restaurant, what we do, we tip well. We, we don't do just 15%. Because 
because we want to be a blessing to somebody else. There have been times when we tip uh, 100% of the, of the cost of the bill. Why? Just, just to be a blessing. And, and, and people respond in such a, I mean, people are appreciative when you recognize that when they help you and do it the right way, they can get blessed as a result of it. Because again, they got to eat too. Come on. Now, and, and, and so you as a Christian, I want, I, here's what I want EBC members to do. I want you guys to seek out an opportunity to be a blessing to somebody who's not expecting it. We all do that. And just watch the reaction when you learn to be a giver. All right? Text says, the king talked to them, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, and Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. Verse number 20, let's go. It says, uh, whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balance judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians and the enchanters in his entire kingdom. Now, Daniel's stellar reputation began in the first year of his captivity and lasted all the way up until he died. Man, it's, 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 it's awesome when we have uh, uh, a good name all the way through life. It's too easy to make one poor decision and choice and, and mess up your reputation. Now, we don't live, we don't live just for the applause of men. Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Because, you know, uh, as believers, we ought to let the love of God shine through our life. And I promise you, if we are growing in our faith, if we're allowing God's love to exude itself in our life, people are going to notice that. Are you with me today? His good reputation not only brought, brought him before kings, but it also brought him great honor and exaltation throughout his entire life. Look down with me, if you will. Uh, we see an instance here in the second chapter. Let's go to Daniel's second chapter. Let's start reading at verse number 19. Daniel chapter 2, verse number 19. Are y'all still with me today? Hey, man, we, we want to be, be the real deal. We want to we be a church. We want to be a body of believers. We want to be individual Christians who are living a life in such a way that, that we honor God in everything that we do. Amen? The text says, is that night the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Now, again, let me, can I, just for a second time, I'm gonna, I want you to go back and read the whole chapter. But what happened was King Nebuchadnezzar, I had a dream, and when he had this dream, um, he asked for his astrologers, his magicians, and others to interpret the dream, but the problem was this. He had forgot what the dream was, and he's asking them to interpret a dream that he can't even tell them what the dream was. Come on, look at this. Can we back up just for a second? This, this was crazy uh, when he began to, uh, to talk about this. Let's go... Um, Go, go back to verse number one. I, I, gotta, I, I want to skip this, but can, can we move? Can y'all read with me fast? I talk fast when I'm preaching, so I'm trying to learn how to slow down. But I need y'all to go with me, okay? Look at what's happening here. And what I want you to know is, and I want you to see is that when God has you, when you are walking in tune with God and his will and his way for your life, God will show you favor in some of the most dastardly circumstances. See, sometimes we, we do a whole lot of complaining about where we are, but I'm t what I'm here to tell you, it doesn't matter where you are. If you learn how to love God, pursue him where you are, God can show you favor in any situation. Part of some of y'all's problem, even in your places of employment, is such that, that, that even it may, may be less than ideal, but you spend so much time complaining about other people rather than being a light in the place that you are. You've been trying to leave and God said, uh-uh, uh-uh. There's some stuff you got to learn. That's why I'm keeping you here. There's some people you got to minister to. That's why I'm keeping you here. So, so stop complaining, stop whining, and say, God, I thank you that I got employment. That's for somebody. I don't know who that was for. That's for somebody up in here. Because ultimately, you are called to work heartily as unto whom? The Lord. the Lord. You're not working unto men. Everything that you do, God is watching you. And God will send tests into your life 
in various manners. Are y'all with me? So some, look, look, look at that. They say some, some things are nothing but a test. All right, let's go. So one night during the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had such a disturbing dreams that he couldn't sleep. He called in his magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers, and he demanded that they tell him what he had dreamed. As they stood before the king, watch this, guys. He said, I, I, I've had a dream that deeply troubles me, and I must know what it means. The text says, then the astrologers answered the king in Aramaic, long live the king. Tell us the dream, and we will tell you what it means. Verse says, but the king said to the astrologers, I am serious about this. If you don't tell me what my dream was and what it means, you will be torn from you, you will be torn limb from limb and your houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. KJV says dung. You know what dung is? That's waste, human waste. He says, but if you tell me what I dream and what the dream means, I will give you many wonderful gifts and honors. Just tell me the dream and what it means. They said again, please, your master, tell us the dream and we'll tell you what it means. The text says the king replied, I know what you're doing. You're stalling for time because you know I'm serious when I say, if you don't tell me the dream, you're doomed. So you have conspired to tell me lies, hoping I will change my mind, but tell me the dream and then I'll know that you can tell me what it means. The text says the astrologer replied to the king, no one on earth can tell the king his dream and no king, however great and powerful, has ever asked such a thing of any magician, enchanter, or astrologer. By the way, and this, 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 may not, this may be a relic of the 1980s. I don't know. Maybe people are still doing this. But I don't care what your, quote, zodiac sign is. <laughs> well, let me, look, let me, let me, let me say about, about Taurus this week. Oh, you're going to have a good week. As a Christian... Why are you following zodiac signs? Reminds me of the song by the floaters. Y'all remember the floaters? Float, float on. I'm Charles. I'm a Libra. Whatever, whatever it was. Some of you from the 80s will get that. Dan, you remember the floaters? <laughs> float on. And it was talking about... The Guys, we as Christians should not engage in horoscopes, palm readings, zodiac signs. We trust God. Life is not about luck. It's about purpose. It's about destiny. All right. Just, just wanted to share that in case some of y'all are looking at your horoscopes. Get in the Bible and find out what God's word says about you. So the king's demand is impossible. No one except the gods can tell you your dream, and they do not live here among people. Next verse says what? Well, the king was furious when he heard this, and he ordered that all the wise men of Babylon be executed. Uh-oh, we got a problem here. Because Daniel and those other three Hebrew boys were part of the wise men now. Text says, uh, next verse, and because of the king's decree, the men were sent to find and kill Daniel and his friends. When Ariok, the commander of the king's guard, came to kill them, Daniel handled the situation with, with what? See, guys, let me tell you something. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. But in all you're getting, get some understanding. Daniel was a man of wisdom. See, some of us don't handle a situation with wisdom and, dis and discretion. Some of us loud and boisterous. Some of us are, are, are so emotional that we don't walk in wisdom. Wisdom and the word are one and the same. So cool your hot temper. Let me ask you a question. How many of y'all have had in the past, wink, wink, <laughs> have had trouble with your temper? You're ain't, you're, you, you get angry real easily. Anybody in the house? Just kind of nod your head. Just like, okay. yeah, yeah. I, I, I know some of you. Yeah. The Bible says this. Listen to me carefully. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. If you are a person who is easily angered and eagerly upset, you're going to find yourself going against what is righteous according to God's word. Because anger, uh, the, the Bible even says this, be ye angry and sin not. Is that what he said, Paul said? 
and let not the sun go down on your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Because when you, when you operate in anger, you won't operate in wisdom. Let me see the hands of everybody who's made a decision out of anger and you regretted it. Come on, raise your hand. You made a decision out of anger. Some of y'all quit, quit, quit the job. I quit. And then you go home, your wife said, uh, baby, you say you quit? You know, the market is due next week. We hadn't bought groceries yet. And you're like, well, I just, I, I, I was just mad. I ain't going to let nobody run over me. Nobody said let nobody run over you. When you go to a job, a place of employment, you know it's your responsibility to submit to those who you're on authority. While you are there, you're working under the Lord, right? And the Lord, the Lord has authority figures in all walks of life. Maybe the Lord just tested you to see if you know how to submit to authority. Because you won't do it at church. Because you, you, you hadn't signed up for one class. That's, 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 that is rebellion. I love you, but it's rebellion. I, I ain't going to throw you away, but I'm going to still tell you the truth. And you limit yourself in growth and you limit yourself in how God can use you when you operate in rebellion. So anger is something you got to watch. But let's not get sidetracked. When Aaron, the commander of the king's God, came to kill, to kill them, Daniel handled the situation with wisdom and discretion. Be a man of wisdom and discretion. He asked Ariok, why has the king issued such a harsh decree? So Ariok told him all that had happened. Daniel went at once to see the king and requested more time to tell the king what the dream meant. The text says then Daniel went home. Now watch this. He goes and requests more times. And then he went home and told his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Some of y'all know him as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That was a Babylonian name. But he, this, this, this is their Hebrew names right here. It says that then Daniel went home and told his friends what had happened. Next verse. Watch this. He urged them. Now watch this. He urged them to ask the God of heaven to show them his mercy by telling them the secret so they would not be executed along with the other wise men of Babylon. That night, the secret was revealed to Daniel in the vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. Who did he praise? Who did he give credit to? He said, praise the name of God forever and ever, for he has all wisdom and power. Next verse says what? Uh, he controls the course of the world events. He removes, watch this now, he removes kings and sets up other kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the scholars. Now, can I park that just for a second? Notice what the Bible says. He controls the course of world events. He removes kings and sets up other kings. God sets up kings and removes kings. Okay, we don't have a king, but God sets up presidents and removes presidents. Watch this. As Christians, we are commanded to pray for our government leaders. It doesn't matter who's in there. Okay, let me talk to Christians now because I, I got I to gotta break open some stuff that I, that I, that I sense. Because listen, guys, men of God, preachers of the gospel should have a prophetic voice. A prophetic voice speaks into, to, into current day situations. I, I got to talk to Christians now because some of y'all didn't pray for Trump when he was in office. Go to 1 Timothy 2. Some of y'all didn't pray. Some of y'all not praying for Biden now that he's in office. But what should we do as a Christian? Come on, let the Bible speak. Don't let it be Dawn Adams. First Timothy, chapter number two. <laughs> Are y'all with me today? Let's start at verse number one. Come on, First Timothy. Paul is writing to his young protege in the ministry by the name of Timothy. And he writes to Timothy. Timothy was a young pastor, and now he's, he's pouring into him, teaching him how to pastor more effectively. But notice what he tells him. He said, I urge you, first of all, to do what? To do what? Pray for all people. Ask God to help them intercede on their behalf and do what? Give thanks for them. Next verse. Let's read. Pray this for kings and what? All. Pray this way for kings 
What way? Back up to the first verse. Come on, let's go back. Can we walk? I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Next verse, let's read. Pray this way for what way? Pray, ask God to help them. Go back to verse 1. Go back to verse 1. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to do what? To help them, to intercede on their behalf, and give thanks for them. Verse 2. Come on, let's go. Pray this way. Intercede, give thanks, and pray for God to help them. For kings and all who are in authority so so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by what? Godliness and what? Dignity. So first and foremost, it does not matter what their, what their party is. It does not matter whether you voted for them or not. If you are a citizen of the kingdom and Jesus Christ is your king, then the Bible tells us how to operate in kingdom principle. And the Bible says right here that we have a responsibility, believers, to pray for kings and all who are in authority, whether it's the governor, whether it's, again, uh, your senator, your U.S. representative, whoever's in authority, whether it's your sheriff, we have a responsibility as a Christian to pray for. Now, if you're going around saying, I ain't going to do that because I don't like him, then you're out of the will of God. There are folks who I know quoted this when Trump was in office. Now they've forgotten it. There are folks who quoted this when Obama was in office, but they forgot it when Trump was in office. Oh, y'all getting quiet on me now. But I'm just, I, I, gotta, I gotta give you the truth. Did I make this up? Brother Jay, put it in the KJV because I'm saying that's the NLT. I don't believe the NLT say the same thing that the KJV says. Let's put it in the KJV. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayer, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority. Say the same thing. That we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. Now, guys, go to Romans 13 with me right quick. I don't know why I'm on this, but, but, but see, guys, we have part of, the, part of the problem with our country today with all of, the, all of the divisiveness and the angst and the anxiety is that the church is not doing it right. See, as a pastor, I'm called to speak to believers. Not necessarily the unbelievers. My message to unbelievers is get saved. Amen. Amen. Some of y'all spend all your time trying to philosophize and debate people who are not even saved. Why are you wasting your time doing that? They can't understand the things of God because they're spiritually discerned. And if they don't have a relationship with the Savior Jesus Christ, and even if they are saved but they're not growing, they're carnal, they can't understand the things of God. You know what carnal Christian is? It's a worldly-minded Christian. Saved, but a worldly-minded. Y'all with me? Romans 13. Romans 13, verse number one. Let's watch this. Watch this. Okay? Some of y'all, some of y'all gonna love me after this. And some of y'all gonna say, Well, I ain't asked for all that. <laughs> but you're here, and you're here, and God, I, all I'm doing is quoting Bible. Okay, don't tell me what your fraternity said, your sorority said, what your mama said, and your daddy said. Don't tell me what your political party said in order to get you reelected. I'm telling you what the Bible says. Listen to what Paul, as he writes to the saints at Rome, what he says. Glory to God. Somebody help me. Is it a little warm in here? Okay. All right. I I didn't want to say that. I I thought somebody would get the hint when I did that. Okay. (laughs) But that's okay. That's okay. Sometimes you got to say it out loud, okay? All right. Everyone, everyone who is Paul writing to, Christians, saints at Rome, everyone must submit to what? Governing authorities. For all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been what? Did I, did, did I just read that? 
Now, understand something here, guys. At the time that Paul writes this letter to the saints at Rome, and he says this in Romans, the 13th chapter, Nero, one of the wickedest kings and emperors to ever rule Rome, was on the throne. Yet Paul says, everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there. Huh? Huh? Is that what it says? Look at verse 2. Come on, let's go. It says what? So anyone who rebels against authority, hear me, anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and they'll be punished. <laughs> verse 3. Come on, can we keep going? It says, for the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of authorities? Do what is right, and they will honor you. Verse 4 says what? Uh, the authorities are God's servants sent for your good, but if you are doing wrong, of course you should be afraid, for they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. Again, we understand that there, there are times when there are evil governments. There are people who are evil who are in government. But what he's talking about is the institution of government. And we should pray for those who are in authority because the Bible says if they're there, God put them there. God allowed it. All right, so now you can't say that God allowed it when Obama was there and, and God, Obama was God's man, Trump wasn't God's man, and, uh, or vice versa. None of them are God's man. It's that God allowed them to be there. Y'all, where were my amens at? Where are my amens? Because I'm going to teach you Bible. I don't care what your friend or, or, or your cousin them said. I'm going to tell you what the scripture says. He says the authorities are God's servants sent for your good. Now, do we have situations where we have evil people in office? Of course we do. Do we have people who are immoral in office? Of course we do. But that does not negate the fact that we have been called upon uh, to... Uh, uh, to, to obey those who are in authority. Daniel was a man in captivity, yet he obeyed those who, who had him in captivity until we're going to see they asked him to do something that violated God's word. Are y'all with me? The point is clear. As long as we can do, as long as we can serve, as long as we're not being asked to do something that violates God's word, we're under obligation uh, to cooperate with the ruling authorities. Doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to endorse all of their policies or approve of every act, specific action that they take. This is especially true in a democratic society where it is the duty of responsible citizens, and let me say this right quick, if you are a responsible citizen, go and vote. Go and vote. Express your opinion. Don't complain if you won't go and vote. Just be quiet. Just shut up and just take whatever's going on. Because ultimately, if, if we're not involved, if we're not making our voices heard, then, then the person who's making their voices heard is one who they're going to be listening to. All right? So get out there and vote. That's just my little sidebar for you. Christians are responsible to uphold biblical righteousness in this hostile culture that we find ourselves uh, living in, okay? While at the same time res expressing respect for leadership. It, 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 it boggles my mind to hear Christians disrespect those who are in the political authority, especially those who are, uh, maybe now your man is not in there, so now nothing that the other man does is right. The Bible says pray for him. God is sovereign over human events, guys. At the same time, he gives people the freedom to make their own choices and go their own way. In other words, no one can become a king, an emperor, a governor, a president, a senator man, or a senator apart from God's will. But this does not mean that possession of political power amounts to a stamp of approval from God. There's a whole lot of stuff that's going on now with government and even prior to this that God did not give his stamp of approval uh, for. But what I'm telling you is, is that we have a responsibility to pray for those who are in authority. 
Are you with me today? Now here we got, we got, <laughs> we got Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has taken Judah captive. Notice what God says about, or what the Bible says about King Nebuchadnezzar, and go to Jeremiah 29, verse 8 and 9. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 8 through 9. So my point is make every effort to maintain a good reputation throughout life. That involves uh, make, make a good rep reputation without uh, having a good reputation throughout your life means that I have to do the thing that the Bible tells me to do. The Bible gives me instructions for how to live. And what, here's what I'm afraid that some of you guys do. Some of you guys live out of your emotions and your feelings. And whatever you do, as a believer, you should be a man or woman of principle and precept and command. If you're going to do something, have word to back up what you do. If you're not going to do something, have word to back up why you're not doing it. Don't go out of your emotions alone. Emotions alone will have you all over the place. Look at what the text says. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel says. Do not let your prophets and fortune tellers who are with you in the land of Babylon trick you. Can we read that again? Out loud on purpose. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel says. Do not let your prophets and fortune tellers who are with you in the land of Babylon trick you. Do not listen to their dreams. Next verse says, because they are telling you lies in my name, I have not what? I have not sent them, says the Lord. Did we get back at uh, next verse? Let's read. This is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years, but then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised, and I will bring you home again. Now, again, what God is saying here is, is that that I'm, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to be the one who brings you home again. I'm going to be the one who's going to be faithful to my word. I took you there in order to, to, to bring judgment upon you so that you could turn your, turn your hearts back toward me, okay? And, and there's, one, there's a passage uh, where it talks about the fact that God says that, that he, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was, was actually his servant that he used to actually bring judgment upon Judah. Go back, to, go back to Daniel chapter 2 right quick. Let's, I'm going to wrap this up with you, okay? So, so wh what are you getting at, Pastor? The long and short of it is that, that God is always in charge. Are y'all with me today? He's always in charge. We may not trust the governing authorities. In many cases, we, 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 we don't trust the governing authorities, but we have to trust him, the rule of all things. Under normal circumstances, we can demonstrate that trust by cooperating with the state, paying our taxes. Remember what Jesus says? When they were trying to trick Jesus and try to get him to go against the government, he wouldn't do it. They says, uh, uh, when they asked him this, uh, you know, uh, what do you say about this paying taxes? And Jesus took a coin and, and looked at one side and says, he told them, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and unto God that which is God." So pay your tithes and your taxes. That's what he said. That, can I put it in doorology? Doorology says, Jesus said, pay your tithes and your taxes. They were trying to get him to go against the government authorities. And Jesus respected governing authorities. So we as born-again believers have to also respect governing authorities. As uh, So... Uh, but in saying that, God, that doesn't mean that we should be blind. Uh, we can never forget that the power of human rulers is subject to a higher power, guys. It's contingent upon the absolute sovereignty of God. So sh should a situation arise where those two authorities are in conflict, who are we to follow? God's authority. Acts, the fifth chapter, tells us that we, th those guys said we'd rather obey God than man. So whenever those governing authorities are in conflict as a Christian, I'm operating under kingdom principle, so I follow kingdom instruction. Are you with me today? All right? So, so again, make every effort to maintain a good reputation throughout life. Daniel did. Let's get back to Daniel chapter 2, and we're going to wrap this thing up today. Guys, I, I need you to understand something. 
how we live makes a difference. How we show forth Christ's love makes a difference in the society and in the community in which we live. We have to make up in our mind that we're going to live our lives according to God's word and according to his will. I just gave you something right now that many of y'all struggle with. And, and some of y'all will, will leave this message and say, well, I don't care what pastor says. I ain't praying for him. I don't like him. I ain't praying for him. Well, I'm just telling you, if you don't, you're outside the will of God. Look at me. I need y'all to look at me. Look me in the eye. The scripture says to pray for those in government authority, whether you voted for them or not, whether you like their policies or not. And if I don't do that, I am out of the will of God. Are you listening to me? Because if we're going to be the real deal, we can't just be the real deal in areas that we like. And that's the problem with a lot of believers. We only want to obey God in the areas that, that it's comfortable to obey. I'm so tired of folks talking about how comfortable they are. Do you not realize that when you go through the Holy Scriptures and begin to look at it, when God was using man, many times the things that he was asking him to do was uncomfortable. As a matter of fact, in my life, guys, I've discovered that when, when I'm moving with God, it's the times when I'm really uncomfortable. Because most of us like to stay where we're comfortable. Well, you know, Pastor, I'm, I'm 55 now. If I ain't changed, about now, I ain't going to change. That's a, that's a poor, that's a, I, I, would, I hoped you wouldn't say something like that. If I ain't changed by now, I ain't going to change. Baby, let me tell you something. If you belong to God, you better always be in the ever state of willing to change to conform to the express image of God's son because God will discipline your tail. Okay, so don't, don't, don't ever be that person. Don't ever be that guy that I ain't going to change because I'm comfortable right where I am. God is moving many of you. He's moving all of us. To, to, to get out of our comfort zone and pursue him so that the plan for his church can come into manifestation. Are y'all with me today? So, so, so we are to make every effort to maintain a good reputation. We, we, we cease to have a good reputation when we, when we get outside of God's will. And a good reputation is not what you post on Facebook. I, can I say something in all honesty, and truth and love. What is missing in some of us when we try to project a certain image to the social media sphere that's not reality in our life? What that tells me is, is that, that, that you, if you're not careful, you, you're looking for the praise of men. Let me, here's, here's how you can tell, okay? Let's say you post something, and immediately you start looking to see the number of likes that you got and the number of shares that you got, and you become disappointed if, if you posted something and you got one like. For those who don't know what I'm talking about, this is on Facebook, okay? And, and, and for those who haven't been following the news, you know, Facebook is, is you know, the, Man, it's, 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 it's amazing how the dynamics of that social media too has been utilized to, to do a lot of dastardly stuff. People are, are purposely going on there putting stuff to get you riled up for political purposes. And you sitting there reading stuff that has a lot of stuff that, that has no credibility whatsoever, but you read it on Facebook. That's your source, Facebook. Come on, guys. I'm not saying that that tool can't be utilized, but get real. Let's be the real deal. Stop faking stuff. Do y'all hear me? Daniel was the real deal, and he was not faking. We saw, when you go back to this, the text, get, get back there right quick. Come on. Listen, listen to what Daniel said. I, I, I promise you I'm closing out. Can I get back there? Thank you, Dan. There we go. Um, Brother Jay, let's, get, let's go down to, hallelujah. 
Y'all help, help, help me here. I left my iPad at home. That's why you got to always bring your Bible. Electronic devices are good, but sometimes you forget them. Sometimes the battery goes dead, but ain't nothing like turning pages. Paper. You can mark it. Look at verse number 27. Says, Daniel replied, there are no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or fortune tellers who can reveal the king's secret. This is Daniel. But there's a God in heaven. Watch this. There's a God in heaven who reveals secrets. He sure enough does. And he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the future. Now, I will tell you your dream and the vision you saw as you lay on your bed. Now, here, here he is getting ready to tell him what he, he couldn't remember. Have y'all ever done it before? Say, say for us, he's like, what? Man, what was that song we used to dance to in high school? You know, what was that song? You, you can remember the song, but once they say it, you say, oh, there it was. That was my song. Yeah, here it is. But he says, while your majesty was sleeping, you, you dream about coming events. Who, he who reveals secrets has shown you what is going to happen. Look at the next. And it is not because I am wiser than anyone else that I know the secret of your dream. I like Daniel's humility. It's not because I'm wise than anyone else. Some folks, if God gave them the vision, the interpretation of it, they would get haughty. Come to me. I'm the man of God. I'll show you what's going to happen to you. Jerry, I see it happen. I see it, Jerry, Jerry. <laughs> I see it, Jerry. The Lord told me to tell you, Jerry, if you bring a $10,000 seed <laughs> to the altar and let it at the pastor's feet, he's going to bless you with a million dollars. Bring the $10,000 seed, brother Jerry. <laughs> How many of y'all have been prophesied to? Now, listen, listen. Now, listen, can I share something with, with you about me? I believe in the whole counsel of God. I believe in the prophetic. I believe prophecy didn't go away with the Holy Scriptures. God still used the prophetic voice. But everybody ain't got a word for you. And generally speaking, when someone is prophesying to you, it should be confirming something that the Lord has already been dealing with you on. Now, unless the Lord had already told you ever to bring $10,000 laid up here, Jerry probably is sitting in his seat. <laughs> Prophecy is usually confirming or exhorting you. And that's why I'm saying we need a prophetic voice to speak into cultural issues today. The church can no longer say, well, we're just going to preach the gospel and don't talk about what's happening in society. God gives us a prophetic voice to understand. Like the sons of Issachar, Brother KD, the Bible says they were able to discern the signs of the time. And we as a church better start discerning what's happening in society. Yeah. And it's not because I'm wiser than anyone else that I know the secret of your dream, but because God wants you to understand what was in your heart. He says, in your vision, your majesty, you saw, the st you saw standing before a huge, shining statue of a man. It was a frightening sight. The text says this, the head of the statue was made of fine gold. Its chest and arms were silver. Its belly and thighs were bronze. The text says, its legs were iron and its feet were a combination of iron and baked clay. Next verse, as you watch, a rock was cut from a mountain, but not by human hands. It struck the feet of the iron clay, smashing them to bits. Text says, the whole statue was crushed into small pieces of iron, clay, bronze, silver, and gold. Then the wind blew them away without a trace, like chafe on the threshing floor. But the rock that knocked the statue down became a great mountain that covered the whole earth. The text says this, that was the dream. Now we're going to tell you what the... Now listen to this. The, the magicians, the astrologers... The soothsayers couldn't do it, but Daniel could because Daniel approached his God. And Daniel said from the very beginning, it ain't me, but it's the God of heaven, the God that revealed its secrets. And there are times, guys, when God will reveal your secret to your pastor as he's preaching to you. He'll be saying something, or, or, or your, your, your small group leader will be saying something, you're like, how did they know that? They didn't know it, but God revealed them the word to give to you. Can I get a witness? And I just gave some of y'all a word about praying for those in authority because you hadn't been doing it. That was the dream. Now we will tell you what the king, what it means. Your majesty, you are the greatest of kings, the God of heaven, the God of heaven. Here's the king that took God's people into captivity, but the text says the God of heaven has given you sovereignty, power, strength, and honor. Who gave it to him? Next verse says what? Well, he has made you the ruler over all the inhabited world and has put even the wild animals and birds under your control. You are the head of gold. But after your kingdom comes to an end, another kingdom inferior to yours will rise to take your place. 
After that kingdom has fallen, yet a third kingdom represented by bronze will rise to rule the world. Text says this, following that kingdom, there will be a fourth one as strong as iron. That kingdom will smash and crush all previous king empires just as iron smashes and crushes everything it strikes. I don't have time to go into the prophetic uh, concept of this, but we'll talk about it next week. The feet and toes you saw were a combination of iron and baked clay showing that this kingdom will be divided. Like iron mixed with clay, it will have some of the strength of iron. The text says this, but while some parts of it will be as strong as iron, other parts will be as weak as clay. This mixture of clay, iron and clay also shows that these kingdoms will try to strengthen themselves by forming alliances with each other through intermarriage. But they will not hold together just as iron and clay do not mix. Next verse says, during the reigns of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. Glory be to God. It will crush all those kingdoms into nothingness and it will stand forever. He's prophetically speaking now. He says, that is the meaning of the rock cut from the mountain, though not by human hands, that crushed to pieces the statue of iron, bronze, clay, silver, and gold. The great God was showing the king what will happen in the future. The dream is true, and its meaning is what? Certain. certain. When God gives you a word, it's a certain word. When God gives you a promise, it will come to pass. Take his word and begin to abide by it. I'm going to stop here today, but I want to tell you, when you know what God's word says, don't let any human being talk you out of God's word. Are you the real deal? Or are you kind of just faking it through, going through it? Do you really love God? Or are you just a church member? Daniel was the real deal. And I, I, I got to stop it because I'm out of time. But I want to encourage you guys. It's time for us as a body of believers to start running. I am convinced that we're living in the last days. I am convinced that God's plan for his church needs to be accelerated. And that means that you got to come out of your comfort zone. Stop, stop being selfish and saying it's all about me and what I want. B baby, let me tell you something. It, there, there's a lot of things that God has called me to do that I'm in my natural bent. I'm uncomfortable doing it. I promise you I am in my natural bent. But what I've decided, and I decided this a long time ago, Dick and Douglas, is that when God gives me instruction, when God tells me to do a thing, I don't care who don't like it. I don't care who comes against it. If God's word is revealed to me, I'm going to find myself doing it, however uncomfortable it may make me be. Because I know God is true and he cannot lie. Daniel gave credit to God. Daniel revealed the king's dream. But it wasn't because of him. It was because of his God, who's the revealer of secrets. Daniel had a good reputation throughout his life. And we'll pick back up on, on next week. So as Christians, we ought to always pursue a good reputation. Always pursue a good reputation. Jason, pop up Proverbs 22 and 1 as we close. Listen to what this says. Proverbs 22 and 1. I need y'all to hear this. Quit going around saying, well, I don't care what nobody thinks. You ought to care. From this standpoint, that don't just say stuff and do stuff that's not in line with God's word and say you don't care what people think. Look at what Proverbs says. Choose a good reputation over great riches. Being held in high esteem is better than silver or gold. Choose a good reputation over great riches. Being held in high esteem is better than having a bunch of money. Now, every head bowed, every eye closed. God is calling upon us to be the real deal. Daniel was the real deal. We'll see later on. It being parlayed out in his life. Now, if you are here in this place today, to become the real deal 
you must first of all make a conscious decision to invite Christ into your heart to save you. It starts with being the real deal starts with uh, each one of us as a human being making a conscious decision whether or not to invite Christ in our heart to be our Lord and our Savior. So if you, if you want to be saved today, if you're not sure if you were to die today where you would spend eternity, I want to give you an opportunity right now to uh, accept the Jesus Christ into your heart and, as your Lord and Savior. If you're listening via live stream, all this, listen, God made it simple. He says, trust in what the Bible says about my son. Jesus Christ died a sacrificial death on Calvary. He was crucified, buried, and resurrected the third day morning with all power and heaven and earth in his hand. It's a matter of trusting in that saving work. Trusting in what Christ did for us. Not our goodness, not how much good we do, but it's what Christ did for us. So you invite him in the heart and say, Jesus Christ comes to my heart to save me. I believe in your sacrificial death and I want to become a born again believer. If that's you, raise your hand right quick. We'll, we'll, we'll receive you at the, end of, at, the, at the end of the service. Glory to God. Or you may be here, you say, Pastor, you know what? You said some things today about uh, being a man of good uh, reputation, about, uh, about what our responsibility is as, as a Christian. Uh, and, and I need to step up in some of those areas. If that's you, you say, Pastor, I'm saved, but I need to step up in some areas. Raise your hand. I want to pray with you right now because God wants to help you in whatever area you need to step up in. If it's praying for those in authority, it's, if it's being a better leader in your home, if, it's being, if it means being a better husband, a better wife, a better parent, and you, just, you, you need prayer in that area, lift your hands. I want to pray for you right now. Even if it means getting better at coming out of your comfort zone, when God is instructing you from the Word and your church family is instructing you as they follow the Lord and you may be uncomfortable, if you need help coming out of your comfort zone, let's, let's pray about it because the Holy Spirit will convict us. Amen? If you belong to God, he'll convict you. Is there another? Let me pray for you right now. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you now and we praise you for this privilege and this honor that you've given us today. We thank you, God, just for having the opportunity to come today to lift up your name. God, I pray for these believers, God, who are, have hands raised in this auditorium right now. Lord, you know the particular area where they may be struggling or they, they, maybe they, there's fear, God. There's, there's, there's fear. They, they, they've been hurt. They've been, they've been, uh, uh, been abused or whatever, God, and, and they have trouble trusting even you and your word. But God, I pray that you would give them revelation knowledge, God, from on high, God. Fill them with your Holy Spirit such that, that no matter what you're telling them to do in your word, that they will let that word govern their actions and not their feelings. Father God, we know we got to move beyond what we feel and what we think to what you reveal in your holy word. I thank you now, Father. Strengthen us. Give us the courage to move with you no matter what it looks like, no matter who's against us, God. Give us the courage to move at your command. For Father, we, we love you and we thank you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' precious name we declare the victory. All in agreement said amen. Come on, give him a hand of praise.